Hi, welcome to Distinti's New Wave Theory. This is the second lecture of the series. In this lecture, we're going to discuss wave energy. For this particular lecture, you really do have to have more advanced mathematical skills. So this will be uh, at least engineering or science bachelor's degree in engineering or science. In this, we're going to review or discuss where the energy in a wave exists. So where is the energy? In water waves, the energy in the wave is stored in both the height and the velocity of the medium, where the kinetic energy would be one-half mass times velocity squared, and potential energy would be mgh. And we're going to discuss this in more detail. Don't try to figure out this diagram here. So let's look at potential energy. If we come to a peak in the wave here, and we see this little column of water, and we say that this little column of water its length is dx. Let's say this is the x direction here, the, the direction of propagation. y is transverse to the direction of propagation, and dh is the height. And so if we take every little tiny cube of water here, and we sum up the, the potential energy of each block, which would be mgh, well m for each little block, or dm, would be dx dy dh times the density of water, and the little bit of energy potential energy for each block, dE, would be dm d, uh, times gh. And so if we integrate now, the energy, the potential energy of each block, which would be the integral from 0 to, to h, h, capital H being the total height, and lowercase h being the, you know, the, uh, the variable used for integration. And so we integrate little h from 0 to big H, and it still says dE dp because it's really the differential energy of a differential area looking down from the top. This is one of those confusing things of mathematics that I have a problem with. This DE is for each block. This DE is for the entire column. Okay, I don't know how to really notate that, so it might be a little confusing. And therefore, what we can do before we do the integration is we can pull the constants out because dx, dy, density, and the acceleration due to gravity are constant. And then, so if we complete this integration, we're going to get um, h squared over 2 over here, which shows up here. And then if we divide both sides by dx dy, then it's the same as dE dA. And so what we end up now is the energy, potential energy density. If we look down from the top, okay, at any point, if we measure the height of any point of the wave, the energy dens density at any area is the, the height at that point squared so if we look at the energy density at the peak of the wave, it's the height of the wave squared over 2 times density times the acceleration due to gravity, and that's the potential energy density in joules per square area. But that's looking down from the top. All right, so therefore we can, we can, we can discuss a wave in terms of potential energy, but that potential energy is max at the peak. What happens when the water gets down to mean sea level. Well, it has no net height at that time, so you know, that must be kinetic energy. Now, let's do the same thing. Let's take our column of water here, because we know, okay, when the wave moves off to the right, okay, that this peak is going to fall back down to sea level. And so if we were to add up the kinetic energy as each block falls to sea level, and sum the kinetic energy as each block falls to sea level, and we go through all that stuff here, we end up with that the kinetic, the, the kinetic energy density at this point here in space is whatever the amplitude of the wave is, and it comes out to be identical to the potential energy density at the peak. Therefore, we find out that the potential energy at the peak is equal to the kinetic energy when the water falls to main, mean sea level. Okay, and so what we can do now, because we want to be able to speak in terms of the velocity of the wave, you know, we're not going to, if we're just looking at the wave here, we don't know what the velocity of the wave was, or the, the amplitude, and so what we can do is make an equivalent for the velocity of the wave. The velocity that's going to be right here, uh, the effective velocity, the velocity that would be, that would be equivalent to what the kinetic energy is. And so we find out there's two energy components, the 
height of the water and the velocity of the water, one giving potential energy, one giving kinetic energy. So all waves are basically a sloshing of energy. Energy goes from kinetic to potential and from potential back to kinetic. And this sloshing of energy between the two types is what wave motion is. Okay, and that's what wave motion is, a continual transfer from one type of energy to the other as the wave propagates. And one of the interesting revelations we learned from this is that the vectors that contain the potential energy and the kinetic energy are parallel. Okay? In other words, in order for this piece of paper to move up and become the peak, well, this velocity has to be in line with where the, where the, where the height is going to be. So our velocity vectors and our height vectors are parallel. They're not orthogonal, but, but they're orthogonal, but they're, it's a weird thing. Okay, although the energy vectors are parallel, they are orthogonal. And you're like, wait, what, what, what? A lot of people are improperly taught in college that perpendicular is orthogonal. If things are perpendicular, they're orthogonal. Well, that's true. If something is perpendicular, it's orthogonal. But orthogonal can also be two vectors in the same dimension, direction. And you say, well, wait, they're not perpendicular. How can they be orthogonal? Well, because you may not be able to add them. You cannot add the height of, an, of a wave to the, the height of the wave to the velocity of a wave. These are two different things. Height and velocity are two different things, like apples and oranges. So even though they're in the same direction spatially, they're orthogonal because you just can't add these two values together. And that's what orthogonal means. Orthogonal means that the two components are independent of each other. You just can't add them. It's like adding apples and oranges. If I have two apples and three oranges, I'll still have just two apples and three oranges. Okay, if I had two apples and two apples, then I can say I got four apples. You can add them. They're not orthogonal. And so we find that the energy at any point in the wave, if I pick the height and the velocity at any point in the wave, the energy is the height squared plus the effective velocity squared. And this is the effective velocity, which would be the effective velocity is square root of 2 h g. And I'll show you how we, we take care of that to make this easier. All right, we already had the discussion on orthogonality. I'm not going to go through this. You can read this on your own. Put the pause on it. And the other thing we have to realize is that the height and the velocity are in quadrature. Quadrature means 90 degrees out of phase. So if this is the real wave here in the blue, the height mimics the actual height of the wave, but the velocity, if we model the velocity over time, the velocity is, is in quadrature, meaning that where the height goes to zero, the velocity goes to max. Where the velocity goes to zero, the height goes to max one way or the other. They're in quadrature. That's critical. All wave phenomenon have the, uh, the energy components in quadrature. Okay? So that's critical revelation two. In critical revelation three, the energy neglecting loss is constant over time and space. And we're neglecting losses right now. Um, so we're neglecting loss. So the energy is the height and the effective velocity squared. If you just take this squared plus zero, this squared plus zero, this squared plus this squared, you end up with constant energy or power or whatever you want to call it as the wave propagates. And so the anomaly with regard to light, and this was covered in the opening video, is that the energy components in light are not parallel. Okay, th these are perpendicular in space. So that's a problem. Well, that's a difference, rather. They're not in quadrature. The energy components are in phase. The energy is not constant, because here the energy is zero. Here the energy is max. And so something is really wrong with this Maxwell's derivation of the plane wave equation. It doesn't match all the other wave phenomenon that we've studied so far. And the biggest problem is it violates conservation of energy, because as stated in the opening video, as the photon passes here, it's zero energy. When a photon passes this point, it's got maximum energy. So you get a photon that blinks as it propagates. And this is not the model we use. 
uh, engineers use A, E to the J, uh, 2 pi FT, or other variants of Euler's model. And so when two waves intersect, if you've got at this point here, you've got two waves intersecting, um, all you have to do to find out what's going to happen at this point in space is all you have to do is you have take the height of wave one plus the height of wave two to find the height of the wave at the point where they intersect. And then at that same point you take the velocity of the wave one plus the velocity of wave two and add them together to get the total velocity at that point. And so, and the total energy at that point is the square of those two sums. Uh, and we can do this because um, everything, the, the H and V are orthogonal, but when they inter intersect, because you can add H to H and you can add V to V, they're linear, you can add them, and that's how you model how waves inter interact, inter interact when they pass each other. It works very well for light uh, and everything else. So now we're going to separate the two energy components, the height and the velocity. And this was stated before, criticalization. Waves propagate by continuously sloshing energy between kinetic and potential. Just like the, the, the pendulum, at this point here where the pendulum is swinging the, the, the fastest, your kinetic energy is maximum, your potential energy is the minimum, not zero, it's just minimum. As the, potential, as the pendulum swings up against the force of gravity, the kinetic energy is converted into potential energy. And once it stops, you have maximum potential energy and your kinetic energy goes to zero. And it, this process repeats over and over and over again until the energy is lost due to losses. But here's an interesting point. A medium must have inertia or mass in order to store kinetic energy. Hell, every definition of energy requires mass somewhere in the definition. You have one half mv squared, you have uh, mgh. So our medium must have mass or something similar to mass, it may be inertia. And that's why people say the energy is stored in electric field, really? Without charge? Oh, and that's critical realization five. A medium with inertia is required in order to have potential kinetic energy and to convert between potential and kinetic energy. Discussing Maxwell more, the magnetic, in, in Maxwell, this is the way Maxwell in his 1890 or 1864, whatever, uh, he, in his work, he specifically states that a magnetic field stores kinetic, ener kinetic energy and an electric field stores potential energy. And somehow these field energies can exist in an empty space without a supporting medium. I don't buy that. And somehow these fields can convert from one to the other without a medium acting as an intermediary? Sorry, I don't buy that either. And we'll talk about these problems later. Let's get on with our basic discussion of waves. So what engineers have done over the years, we have basically just said, let's just take height or the, 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 the energy at the height and just call that amplitude. When, what we're going to do is we're going to say that the, ener the potential energy component, which is going to be the height, is going to be the magnitude, some magnitude times cosine of 2 pi ft, and the, kinet and the effective velocity, which is proportional to the kinetic energy, is going to be that same magnitude times sine 2 pi ft. And then what they found, and this is, works right into a Fourier series. Okay, but what, when you try to add them together, you can't add them together because your height, your kinetic energy, your potential energy, and your kinetic energy components are orthogonal. So what they did was they said, okay, let's just arbitrarily assign the kinetic energy to an imaginary dimension. So therefore, it keeps these two separate. Not an orthogonal. It's an orthogonal dimension, but it's not orthogonal in space. And so then comes Euler's equation, e to the j theta, which has this mechanism already built in, separated for us. It's identical to what we just came up with over there. And therefore, we engineers and physicists have come up with this Euler's equation to model waves propagating in free space and to account for both energy components. But there are three major problems with this model that most scientists and engineers don't know. Okay, Euler's equation only mimics the observed behavior of waves. It only says, gee, at this point in time we're going to have, uh, and then as, as we rotate, you can see how the wave moves as we rotate the slinky. You can see the, oops, I keep it from bouncing. Okay, so therefore, 
This only mimics the observed behavior. It doesn't explain why a wave takes a sinusoidal shape. It just says it is. And this is a way to say, ah, this is where it's going to be at time t, at time t plus 1, and this is going to be you know, the height and the velocity. This is just a mimic of the observed phenomenon. It is not an explanation of how waves work. It's just like, hey, we know the sun rises in the east and settles in the west, and it does it the same way every single day, and that's a good enough model to do a lot of things with. But it doesn't explain why the sun rises in the east and settles in the west. And same with Coulomb's model. Coulomb's model, people think, well, this is, they call it Coulomb's law. It's not a law. It wasn't handed to us by God and stone tablets. This is an empirical data where people realize that the force of attraction between two charged spheres based on distance follows an inverse square relationship. And so the way you can tell that you have an empirical model is this arbitrary constant of relation which takes arbitrary measurements and converts them to a force. Okay, and rule of acquisition three, monkey do does not mean monkey no. Just because we can model, mimic something accurately does not mean we understand it. Problem number two with Euler's equation. It's only an approximation valid for very small waves where the medium is still significantly linear. When the amount of energy exceeds the capacity of the medium, the medium will break, but this model does not account for that. In other words, when your wave energy becomes too much and the depth of the water is not deep enough to contain the energy, your waves are going to break. You put too much energy in a guitar string, the guitar string is going to break. Put too much sound pressure on a glass, its glass is going to break. Okay, so this is not a complete explanation. It's a good a mimic. It's a good, uh, you can take it to the bank, but you can't ask it how waves actually work. This is like saying that a wave is sinusoidal and it propagates at a certain speed and it's going to keep it sin. And you can add these waves together in different ways to make different wave functions or, you know, but that's all it tells you. It's a good mimic of wave behavior, but it's not an explanation of wave behavior. Okay, an Euler's equation problem number three. It's an excellent, very excellent model for radio waves and in antenna theory. And because it's customary to plot the real and the imaginary if as if they're perpendicular in space, we plot the real and the imaginary as if it's perpendicular in space, but it's not. It's just orthogonal as far as units go. But because this mimics what we see the way Maxwell plotted where, according to Maxwell, the electric and magnetic fields really are perpendicular in space, we kind of inadvertently see that these are the same thing when they're most certainly not the same thing. Okay, these are orthogonal energy components. They are, they're actually parallel in space. We plot it this way. Um, this is real and imaginary, where this would be x, y, and z, or time. Time and z would be analogous. Okay, and so there we, we kind of have lost the fact that these are not the same thing. These are very different things. So it gives false notion that Maxwell got it right because that's the model we use. But if you look at this closely, this is in quadrature. This isn't. These vectors are actually orthogonal in space, perpendicular in space. These are not perpendicular in space. They're only orthogonal in units. Okay, so there's a big difference between a model and theory that mimics natural behavior and a model theory that explains it. Maxwell's plane wave model tries to explain how EM electromagnetic waves work. However, it's different from the mimic model that we actually use, which is what I just explained in the previous. Okay, so electromagnetic waves are analogous to waves traveling in a medium. In other words, we use the same mimic, the same e to the j theta, for water waves, sound waves, and electromagnetic waves. By knowing uh, the behavior of the energy in a wave gives us a clue to determining the reasonable mechanism by which electromagnetic waves propagate. This is the mimic that works. This is different from this. This is what we're going to use, not this, to back out the true nature of electromagnetic wave propagation. Thank you very much.